Hi everyone, welcome to day 11 of Emmanuel, God with us. Today we will be looking at how Jesus came and Jesus comes to reign as King forever. So our first Bible reading is 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting in verse 8. Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own, and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people shall not oppress them any more, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands, but my love will never be taken away from him. As I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you, your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Then over into the prophet Isaiah chapter 11, starting in verse 1. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and of understanding. The spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his, with his eyes, or decide what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor. Of the earth he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and the little child will lead them. And then over into the New Testament, into the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, starting in verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. And he said to them, How is it that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put my, your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Then over into Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 29. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet, and knew that God had promised him, on oath, that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing that was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of it, exalted to the right hand of God, 
he has received from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptised, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And then finally, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. The sun is the radiance of God's glory, and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provi provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Um, back when we were allowed to do such things, uh, going to Christmas concerts and Christmas performances from orchestras and that kind of thing is quite a, a popular to thing, thing to do round about now. And uh, even though I've never actually witnessed it firsthand, I hear that going and <clears throat> experiencing Handel's Messiah um, from a live orchestra perspective is just awe-inspiring. And, and even to this day, um, people will still stand as an act of um, like reverence and as an act of like appreciating the the immensity of that moment as that hallelujah chorus begins to play. And uh, according to legend, apparently this all started way, way back in 1743 in uh, the London premiere of the Messiah. And the story goes that... Um, King George II actually stood up at this point during the concert, that he was so overcome with emotion and so um, overwhelmed by, by what he was experiencing in, in his senses that, that all he could do was stand at this, that this majesty uh, that was being kind of performed before him, that this king of a nation was all, somehow recognising this greater king. And uh, that's what the, the story goes. Uh, there's other kind of variations on it that actually uh, King George just had pins and needles and the only way he could relieve it was by standing to remove it. But to that we say, bar humbug. Because I really like this idea of the fact that that this king, this this highest member of state at the time, felt felt he had to stand, he had to respond to the greater king. Now, in these uh, many and long readings that we've had today, uh, we see examples of this forever king that's promised. See, King George II isn't our king today. His time has come and gone, but there is one king that will rule and reign forever. And this promised forever king um, is told of in 2 Samuel 7, where David was, was his idea was that he was going to build God a house. He was going to build God's temple. But in fact, God said, no, you can't do that. In fact, I'm going to build you a house. Because God says, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. In Isaiah 11, this again, this forever king is prophesied and promised about and how the, all the bad stuff that has happened to Israel, it's like, it's like this tree that has been chopped down and all that's been left is this stump. But it says, from that pathetic and, and a miserable image sprouts will begin to grow a shoot will begin to grow new life will come from that dead stump and that is that forever king that is promised that will bring hope in Matthew the forever king actually arrives on the scene some aren't sure whether this is the promised messiah or not 
They even ask earlier on in the, the Gospels, could this be the son of David? Could this be the forever king? Even the leaders of Israel, the people whose job it was to recognise God and recognise the movement of God, couldn't accept that Jesus was this forever God, forever king that God had promised. And then finally in Acts 2, the forever king was declared when when filled by the Holy Spirit, Peter stands and gives that first big sermon where he proclaims that Jesus is the king through his death, burial and resurrection. That he is this living and exalted one. So today, on this day of Advent, as we think about how Jesus comes to reign as king forever, may our hearts, may the posture of our, our innermost being stand to honour Jesus Christ as that forever king. That he is the son. He is the radiance of God's glory, we're told. And that the exact expression of his nature from Hebrews. He is the one who sustains all things by the power of his word. And then we're told at the end in Hebrews, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And that king shall reign forever. Amen.